23.15. All right, well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you this morning and worship together. It's a blessing to have that opportunity. And I uh, just want to say, I've got a few introductory things we need to, to talk about before we get into the lesson, so bear with me on that. But first of all, uh, we've got a lot of visitors, thankful for your presence and super encouraged by that. And some, some are family and, and some are, are just from the community and, and we are, are grateful for that as well. So whatever the reason you're here, we're, we're glad you are this morning. And uh, also, you probably noticed that uh, the live stream uh, in installation has been completed. And I just wanted to thank Steve and Darren for a lot of work that they put in uh, helping me with that. And uh, not just to give them praise and, and you know, credit for that, but also just to say there are so many ways that any and all of us can serve to help God's good news, the gospel be spread, and to help the work of the church here. So let's all look for, for those ways that that we can help and, and serve in, in God's kingdom. And, and that will be a good thing for, for us and, and for the Lord's vineyard. So I wanted to encourage you by way of that as well. Well, uh, this morning, if you would open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and that's where our study will, will be this morning. A few weeks ago, we talked about the kingdom of heaven and that lesson was based on the Gospel of Matthew, which is something we just recently finished studying in our Sunday morning Bible class. Maybe you remember that, maybe you don't. But in any, in any case, uh, in studying the kingdom of heaven, we explored the idea that it is an upside-down kingdom uh, compared to all other kingdoms. We talked about how the values of the kingdom of heaven are not necessarily the values of the world or even the values of our country. They're different values. But we also talked about how, in truth, it is the kingdom of heaven that's actually right side up not the other kingdoms. And the reason for that is that God, being the creator of the world, gets to set the standard by, by which all things are measured, the standard for what is good, what is true, what is, what is beautiful. And so his standard is the rule by which all things ought to be measured. And so I've continued to think about that idea of the kingdom of heaven being upside down from what is considered normal or expected in the world. And the reason I kept thinking about it is that I kept seeing it pop up in our study of the book of Hebrews as well. As we go through that study on Wednesday night, it just keeps, keeps coming up. But instead of speaking just about the kingdom, the book of Hebrews is focused even more so on the king of that kingdom, which of course is Jesus. And it's pointing to, to that king. As we've noted in our Wednesday night study, the author of Hebrews is pointing his audience to this idea that Jesus is greater than everything. That Jesus is better, not to throw that away. And what we have in Jesus is better than anything else we could possibly compare him to. And so the Hebrews writer makes that point very well, of course. But in demonstrating why Jesus is so much greater, the Hebrews writer brings up some really strange concepts that would be pretty shocking to a first-time reader of the Bible, if you were reading it for the first time. He repeatedly brings up this idea that the Father intended for Jesus to suffer in sending him to earth. And specifically, that he would not only suffer, but suffer death. And this really is unexpected. We're used to that because we read the Bible and we know the gospel message. But if you're reading this for the first time, that'd be pretty, pretty shocking. And first of all, though, what, what king comes with the intention of suffering and dying? What other king makes that his purpose? But not only that, the Jews knew very well about the Messiah who had been prophesied. This Messiah was described as a great king who would reign forever and would crush all the enemies of God's people. So hearing that this Messiah and king actually came to suffer and die would probably be pretty hard to come to grips with for those first century Jewish people. But yet suffering and dying is exactly what Jesus came to do. And though he was and is a king... Jesus came to suffer and die. That sounds a bit crazy, and it would be if his mission were like that of earthly kings. But just as the kingdom of heaven is upside down, its king is also not what you would expect a typical king to be. And so I want to spend our time this morning considering this idea of Jesus being an atypical king, not a normal king, an unexpected king. The idea of his not being what we would normally think we would see out of a king. In addition to considering some of these ways in which Jesus is an unexpected king uh, of the upside-down kingdom, uh, we're also going to think through some applications for us as we make it our goal to live as servants of the king of the upside-down kingdom of heaven. 
So let's begin by reading our text for this morning, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. This text begins... It speaks of Jesus in very suitable, kingly language. It describes him as crowned with glory and honor, language befitting a great and mighty king. And then the next sentence, he talks about death, but then it says he was, it was fitting that he, when you get that phrase with all the kingly language, you would think it would be more of that kingly language. It was fitting that he was crowned with more and more glory or something like that. But that's not what it is. There's not descriptions of Jesus along the lines of traditional kingship and exaltation. Instead, we are told it's fitting for this king to suffer. To suffer? That isn't suitable for a king. That doesn't fit the image of a typical king. That is unexpected. A king is to be protected. A king is to be safeguarded. Honored. A king shouldn't have to suffer in our expectations of a king. He should have others to do that for him. He should have an army to send out and you die for me and I'll stay here protected on my throne in my castle, right? And if we're thinking in terms of typical earthly kings, that would certainly be true. But when it comes to Jesus, let me suggest to you that Jesus had a different mission. Unlike earthly kings, Jesus' mission was not to live and reign on an earthly throne as long as possible until he eventually died and his reign was over. It's different with Jesus. But this, of course, would be typical of most kings, most earthly rulers. We even see this in the Old Testament as Israel's kings started to slip further and further away from God's commands and God's ideals. Some of those kings and even a queen killed others in their quest to maintain and protect their power, to protect their reign for as long as possible. And you see this even more in the leaders of nations outside Israel and Judah, as men are gladly willing to spill others' blood and to hurt others to keep their power. They'll trample anyone and everyone on their way to the top to attain that power. So that's the norm. But Jesus is different. His goal was not to exalt himself. Rather, he came to learn obedience. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what? He suffered. What a strange thing for a king to seek, right? Learning obedience? You think about that. Isn't that usually the case for what the king seeks from other people? A king wants his subjects to obey him. But this king came to learn obedience. Interesting. That wasn't the case for Jesus. He came to learn obedience through suffering. Not because he needed to be more obedient but because we did, but we failed at it. He came to be obedient in order that our disobedience might be forgiven and overcome by his obedience, even though he's the true king. And so that's what's meant by this idea in Hebrews chapter 2, back in our text, of bringing many sons to glory. Most kings seek glory for themselves. They want other people to obey them and honor them, and so they seek that. But Jesus sought to bring others to glory. In fact, he sought to bring everyone to glory to glory. He tasted death for everyone. And even in our day, political leaders who are regarded as good or even relatively nonpartisan, when they're given the chance to appoint people to positions of authority in a cabinet or something like that, they appoint people they know, people they agree with or or can help them or will be on their side, generally. It's just what you do. Jesus, on the other hand, came to bring many sons to glory. And the book of Hebrews goes on to show us that by many sons, what is meant is anyone who will come to Jesus and obey him. The end of verse 9 tells us that Jesus came to earth intending to taste death for everyone. Not just for people who would like him. Not just people who would support him, keep him safe, agree with him immediately, readily accept him. 
Jesus came to taste death for everyone. And we see that really is the case as the New Testament continues after Jesus' ascension in the book of Acts by describing all kinds of people who came to follow Jesus who previously had crucified him or had persecuted his disciples. Sure, maybe you could find an earthly leader who's willing to have like a token nonpartisan pick for a cabinet position, but one who makes it his aim to bring to glory the people who want to assassinate him? Jesus is pretty upside down, pretty unexpected in this way compared to all other kings. But that's because, again, Jesus had a mission that was different from all other kings. To bring many sons to glory was his mission. But in keeping with that mission, Jesus himself acted differently. As an individual person, Jesus was not like other kings and who he was. Truly, Jesus was a different kind of king. I mean, just think about it. He achieved his life's purpose through willingly suffering. And the rest of his life points toward that goal. Jesus wasn't busy trying to look charismatic and happy all the time. Jesus didn't try to make people feel good about themselves so that they would support him. Jesus didn't even try to get in with the kinds of people who could help him. We looked in the lesson about the upside-down kingdom and how Jesus spent his time with really the exact opposite kind of people uh, from those who were influential or powerful or uh, in religious or political communities of the day. And that's what we see throughout the Gospels, as we considered in that previous lesson. In Matthew chapter 4, we looked at it in verse 23 beginning, right before the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus being among the poor, the sick, and the needy. And these were the people he spent his time with. These were the people this king focused on. And that's just characteristic of the kind of king, the kind of person that Jesus is, as we see throughout the rest of the Gospels. But when it came to the people who could have helped Jesus a lot, if he wanted to gain some influence and power in the synagogues or in the culture of the day, not only did Jesus have no more regard for them than for the poor and the sick, he openly rebuked them. He went to them and told them, you're doing this all wrong. You got this wrong. What kind of a king does that? Well, not a king who's trying to build an earthly kingdom over which he can have much power. But clearly, as we looked at just a moment ago, Jesus had a very different mission than most kings do. But he was also a different person than most kings are. Jesus as a person was devoted first and foremost to obeying his father. He was a humble person that he submitted perfectly to the father, yet bold in that he was willing to speak the father's truth when others were standing in its way. You see, an earthly king would try to manipulate people and maybe deceive them and trying to get them on their good side. Uh, that is, until they no longer needed them, at which point they just cast them off and show them how they really felt about them. I didn't need you. I, well, I just needed you for a little while, but I didn't really like you anyway. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't manipulate people. Jesus was honest with people, even when the truth was hard to hear. He was never unnecessarily rude, but he was just honest. Someone needed to hear that they were not in step with God's truth, the Father's truth. Jesus rebuked them in an attempt to keep them and those who heard from suffering the results of false teaching. But even crazier and more unexpected, when the rubber met the road and suddenly there's some consequences for these bold statements that Jesus has been making to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and those consequences are looming pretty large on the horizon, Jesus didn't back down. Jesus didn't say, you know what, I'm sorry. Didn't really mean to say that. Uh, it was a little too harsh. You, you know what? You're actually, you're right. I, I just got confused. I was having a rough day. Said some things I didn't mean. My bad. Forgive me. No. Instead, because he was just speaking the truth he received from the Father. He stood firm behind his Father's word and his Father's will. And Jesus clearly knew where this road of honesty and boldness in the Father's truth was going to lead him. It would lead him to suffering and death, and he knew that. And any typical king is going to see the writing on the wall and back paddle real quick and try to smooth things over and have your PR assistant kind of work on that. But not Jesus. He continued steadfastly down that path because it was fitting that he would be made perfect through suffering. This king came to learn obedience, to suffer and die in obedience to his father in order that those of us who have disobeyed might be made righteous and forgiven of that. As the Hebrews writer says, he obeyed and therefore suffered in order to bring us to glory. 
For Jesus, his mind wasn't captive to these temporary and physical concerns. That's not because he didn't experience those as a human. Hebrews chapter 4 that we just studied on Wednesday night tells us that he was definitely tempted as we are. We can be confident of that. But even though he was fully human and experienced what it's like to be in the flesh, Jesus was focused on something greater. His father. He was focused on his father. And this is why it was fitting for him to suffer, because the Father's purpose for him was to bring many sons to glory. And he would have to suffer and die to do that. And despite such a high cost, Jesus steadfastly submitted himself to his Father. That's who he was. He was an obedient son. And he did this in order that by his obedience, we too might become sons and daughters of God. So if that's who we are, that's our part in this, but it naturally follows that like Jesus, we need to have a different kind of mission for our lives. I trust you're familiar with some of the last recorded words that we have that Jesus spoke to his disciples before his ascension, uh, when he ascended to his rightful kingly station at the right hand of the Father. And those words are recorded for us in Matthew 28. We call it the Great Commission. It says in verse 18 of Matthew 28, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Just as Jesus' mission was to bring many sons to glory, the Great Commission tells us that the same was true for his disciples. Just as Jesus did not come to serve his own interest, even as the king, so we have to do the same. Our interest can't any longer be in ourselves, but now we're concerned with the welfare of others. We're concerned specifically, while we ought to care for their physical needs, as Jesus did, we ought to be most concerned with their spiritual welfare. In fact, we ought to put their spiritual welfare over our physical welfare, so that's exactly what Jesus did in coming to die for the spiritual welfare of the world. Jesus suffered and died, denying himself in doing so, but acting in the best interest of the world. Now, while we are not in a position to save the entire world as Jesus was, we don't need to do that because he already did that. But now that he has made salvation possible for everyone by tasting death for everyone, Hebrews 2 and verse 9, our task is to go to everyone we can and, and point them to Jesus, to bring them to Jesus, whose mission was and is to bring many sons to glory. And it's by coming to Jesus that we have been brought to glory and will be brought to even greater glory in God's new creation. Our mission is different. In the Upside Down Kingdom lesson, we looked at the Beatitudes and how in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. This is pretty odd to people who are not Christians. Again, it's one of those things we read and we're used to. We've read it before, but if you're not a Christian, it's crazy. I think sometimes we forget just how odd it is because we don't want to look odd ourselves. We don't want to stand out in a way that makes people think we're weird. But the truth is our mission is odd to the world. It just is. It doesn't make sense from a physical, worldly standpoint. And the same was true of Jesus' mission. He did everything wrong if he was trying to set up any sort of kingdom on this earth. But that wasn't his goal. And neither should it be ours. The idea of joining in Jesus' mission and suffering alongside him is actually an idea that the Hebrews writer mentions as he gives his closing exhortations in the book in chapter 13. This is a text off of which Laura based a hymn that she wrote, and it's just been percolating in my brain for quite a while after she gave me the latest version to record, and we sang it at the singing in Aurora. And so tying that in with this lesson just felt natural. But this text in Hebrews 13 lays out exactly what we've been talking about when we speak of joining in Jesus' mission and suffering alongside him. If you would flip over a couple pages, Hebrews chapter 13, we'll start in verse 12. So, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. 
Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This text, it speaks of a life of sacrifice, a life of suffering, a life of being an outcast. Again, it's, it's an odd mission that we're called to. There's no getting around that. But this text is also helpful because it explains the purpose of all of this. That's that we're not seeking a city here on this earth. We seek a city that is eternal, a lasting city that is to come. And that's what's so odd to people who are not looking beyond the here and now, beyond what benefits them in the short term in this physical life. And that's why Jesus is such an unexpected king, because so many people in the world are not looking to those things which are eternal, but just what's temporary and what's earthly. And so our mission, Jesus' mission, again, it's strange to the world. This idea of suffering, taking up your cross even, which we are called to, and which for Jesus was very literal, taking up his cross. It's very unexpected for a king, let alone desirable to, for anybody, to people of the world. It's hard to understand. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's the power of God. And it is our mission to share that power of God with the world for which Jesus suffered and died to bring many sons to glory. So, we have a different mission as well. But if we have this wildly different mission, that means we also are to be a different kind of people as well. Just as Jesus acted and behaved differently, even acted and behaved unexpectedly, just as he prioritized different things than the kings of the world did, so we must also act differently and unexpectedly and prioritize different things than citizens of only this world do. Giving up our lives and sacrificing them for the sake of God's mission and for the sake of others' spiritual welfare is acting differently. That's not normal. It will be unexpected. People are not expecting that, yet that's what we're called to be. The first talk, I, or excuse me, the first text I ever gave a short talk on was the passage in 1 Peter 2 that talks about how we as, as God's people are to be different and to live in a way that surprises the world but pleases God. And that always stood out to me. I want to read a chunk of this text this morning, and even though it's a, a bit long, I think you'll see why I wanted to read the entire passage. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. That's just a different life than the world lives. It's different. But you know what? So was Jesus' life. It was different too. The end of this text says that Christ suffered for us, leaving an example for us. It's uncomfortable for us sometimes to look different, for us to act unexpectedly, not as the people around us are acting. Sometimes names will be thrown out. You guys are a cult. A bunch of goody two-shoes. Sometimes it's looks we get. Sometimes we just feel it ourselves that we're different from the world around us, and that's hard. It is. It's okay to say that. It's hard. But we can take heart in knowing that Jesus, the king of the kingdom of heaven, was not at all what the world expected either. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. So it's okay if people think you're weird. Living a different life from the world is what we are called to do 
in Christ and by Christ's example. But it's tough. It's tempting to water down the gospel of Christ, to modify it slightly, both for others, to soften the message and make it easier to receive so people don't get offended as easily, and for ourselves, just to not give as much attention to the things about the calling of the gospel that make us odd to the world or that are hard for us personally. But Jesus' example shows us that even when the pressure was on and even when people with authority started getting upset about the truth from the Father that Jesus insisted on teaching no matter what, he didn't back down. He didn't return evil for evil, but he just kept showing love and teaching truth and living the way the Father had called him to live. And even when the Jewish leaders didn't want to hear a word of what he said, and even people who had previously followed him began leaving him in droves, Jesus just continued steadfastly in showing love, teaching truth, and living in a way that pleased his Father. And the same has to be true for us in the way we live. Just as Jesus did not shape his life around his own preferences and what he wanted, but submitted to the Father, no matter what the cost was, we have to do that too. We have to submit to Jesus and to the Father. There's no getting around the fact that it, just as Jesus submitting to his Father led him to act in unexpected ways that were uncomfortable for people, our calling to submit to Jesus as our King will lead us to do the same. Even if our friends leave us and they don't want to listen to us anymore because we want to talk about the gospel, Jesus experienced the same thing. No matter what the cost is, we just have to follow Jesus. It's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it. It will be worth it. That's because going back to Hebrews 13, we don't seek a temporary city here that's just going to be destroyed in a matter of time, but we seek a lasting city, an eternal city where God dwells. And the gospel is that Jesus is the unexpected king of that heavenly kingdom, and he has paved, he has opened, he has founded, and is the way by which we can be part of that kingdom. Are you part of that kingdom this morning? If you are, are you living in a way that's true to your calling in Christ? Are you unashamed of the gospel? Are you even unashamed of its radical demands of people and even the hard parts? Are you living out your mission? Are each and every one of us living out that mission as a different kind of person in Christ? Let's all consider those things this morning. I think a lot of times invitations, we start to think, okay, well, let's get the songbooks, and this is for the people who haven't been baptized. This is, this is for all of us. This is for me. I need this. I don't like to look weird. I like people to like me. That's not what we're called to by the gospel. We all need to make sure that we live in a way that's true to our calling no matter what. So I'd encourage you, consider these things this morning. Stir one another up to love and good works every day, as we talked about in class on Wednesday. If there's a spiritual need we can help you with this morning, we'd love to, to take care of that as well. And if you would, let us know by coming to the front as we stand and sing.